5 Watt World is supported in part by TrueFire. Learn, practice, and play with TrueFire. Hi, this is Keith Williams. Welcome to 5 Watt World. We're interested in helping you get the most music from the least gear. When I first got out of college at 83, I didn't own a television. I couldn't afford one. And I was a reader, so it really didn't feel like I was missing out. But I got a job in college admissions that would send me out on the road and put me in hotels. And hotels with televisions and cable. <laughs> I still didn't yearn for TV. Well, you know, except I did miss Austin City Limits. So in 88, I found myself in Howard Johnson's Motel in Framingham, Massachusetts. After a long day, I got back to the room where the show was already on. And as the TV warmed up, there was a guy in a marching band uniform, shredding pentatonics in a way I'd never heard before. The tune ended. He checked his tunings and set up a pulsing pedal tone. Next came a beautiful chord melody intro, artificial harmonics, and what sounded like a Japanese koto. These were tones from a guitar I'd never heard before. I didn't realize this was a rambling intro. I was so engrossed in the chords that when Eric Johnson hit the switch for that soaring lead tone drenched in delay that made Cliffs of Dover so famous, I was unprepared, and I dumbly sat down onto the bed. How could I have seen that coming? It would be two more years before that tune made it onto Avia Musicom in 1990. And if you did play guitar, and you hadn't heard of him by that point, well, your world probably changed that day. So if you want to hear the stories of the guitars he's used over the years to set us all wondering how he does it, then stay tuned, because this is the 5 Watt World Short History of the Guitars of Eric Johnson. If you enjoy our videos, make sure to subscribe. And if you've already subscribed, grab a t-shirt or a stomp preset pack to support what we do. And to become a bigger part of 5 Watt World, sign up for Friends of 5 Watt on Patreon. The links are in the description. Eric Johnson was born on August 17, 1954, in Austin, Texas. It was a musical family. Eric and his three sisters all studied piano at an early age, and by the time Eric was 11, he was drawn to learning the guitar as well. This was at the height of the British pop invasion, with the Beatles and Rolling Stones as regular guests on The Ed Sullivan Show. During the 60s, Eric would hear and subsequently be influenced by players in a wide variety of genres, including Jimi Hendrix, Mike Bloomfield, Eric Clapton, Wes Montgomery, and Django Reinhardt. By the time he was 15, he was playing in his first professional band, a psychedelic rock group named Mariani. They cut a demo that has now become a collector's item. In those early years, Eric had two strats. He'd ordered the first one through a local music store. We don't have any pictures of him with that guitar, but he said it was a white guitar with a maple neck based on the one that Hendrix had played at Woodstock. The second guitar is a 1958 black strat nicknamed Faye. The guitar would be stolen from his home along with his other instruments in 1982. Miraculously, in 2006, when looking for a vintage tube screamer, he went into a local pawn shop and he would come across Faye again. Eric had kept the serial numbers of all his guitars, and when he went home and checked, that all the original guitars were there. He was able to buy them back 24 years later. He still has most of those guitars to this day. After high school, he briefly attended the University of Texas at Austin, but 1974 found him playing with local jazz fusion group. They toured regionally with some local following, but when they were unable to get a record deal, in 1977 they disbanded. Eric formed a trio with drummer Bill Maddox and bassist Kyle Brock. The trio format would become the vehicle for his performing for the rest of his career. They worked the Austin scene, eventually recording the album Seven Worlds. During this time, Johnson also did session work with Carole King, Cat Stevens, and Christopher Cross, who at the time were some of the biggest acts in the world. Among the guitars that were stolen in 82 was a 1962 three-tone Sunburst Strat. It only had the guitar for about a year before it was stolen. The pickups in the guitar are actually Fender Mustang pickups that he had Seymour Duncan rewind to be slightly hotter than Stratocaster pickups. The pickups are similar to the 5-2 pickups that Duncan sells today. And now we come to what might be Eric's most famous guitar. In his late 20s, Eric, already famous for the punishing volumes he played at, went to a shop to get a speaker reconed. While there, he noticed that over in the corner was an old Strat that was there to have a pickup repaired. No case, just leaning against the wall. He asked about it and was given the owner's number. The owner said that it had been his grandfather's guitar, but if Eric had a Gibson he wanted, he'd trade him for it. So Eric found the guitar the guy wanted, and they did the swap in the parking lot of a grocery store. 
This guitar was the famous 1954 Strat that Eric named Virginia. The name came from the fact that very early in Stratocaster production, there were four women at Fender assembling the Strats. To keep them straight, they would put a piece of masking tape inside the pickup cavity and write their name on it. When Eric had the guitar apart, he saw that this marker was still there and the name was Virginia. The guitar is unique in a number of ways. First, it has a body made of sassafras wood. For some reason, Fender built a small number of Telecasters in 53, and then also Stratocasters in 54, out of this unusual wood. No one really knows why, but we do know that Leo Fender was famous for being frugal, and if he could get the wood for the bodies with a nice straight grain at a good price, well, it isn't hard to imagine him ordering it up. Eric believes that this body wood impacted the unique tones of the guitar. The pickups in the guitar were not original 54s, but instead were from a later 50s guitar. As such, they were not reverse wound to provide humbucking because there was no position for neck and middle position on the original three-way switch. When a five-way switch was installed, Eric realized that when both neck and middle were both on, they were out of phase. This out of phase sound is similar to what Peter Green got. This out of phase tone contributed greatly to Eric's use of artificial harmonics. It also created the unique tone for his faux koto techniques as Eric had a lifelong love of Japanese music. As Eric had done on many of his guitars since, he installed a DiMarzio HS2 stacked humbucking pickup in the bridge with only the bottom coil connected for a slightly hotter and warmer tone. Then to get some of the highs back, he'd use a 500k volume pot. But that's overgeneralizing, as he would search through the batch of 500k pots, trying to find ones between the stock 250k and the 500k they were labeled. He said his favorites would fall just under 400k. He also moved the tone control from the middle pickup over to the bridge pickup. This small mod has become a stock wiring today. A tech named Zach Barry in Austin suggested to Eric that he could get a lower action if they took the original 7 and a quarter inch radius fretboard down to 12 inches and installed bigger frets. Remember, at the time, you could buy a 50 Stratocaster for about $300, so folks weren't nearly so precious with these guitars back then. Eric would go on to modify his other vintage strats in the same way ever since. Eric thought that the high E string on that guitar was too bright compared to the B string, so he installed a modern Graftech saddle to soften the tone of just that string. He also put a nylon spacer under the string tree to raise it up just a bit, putting less tension there and helping the string slide through with the tree more easily. Virginia was Eric's main touring and recording guitar during the years of the Tones, Avia Musicom, and Venus Isle Records. Sadly, the guitar was knocked over at some point and Eric felt that this negatively impacted the tone, and he sold the guitar. In 2020, Fender issued a limited run of master-built copies of Virginia and also began producing a production guitar with the same specs, including the Sassafras body wood. After Johnson's instruments were stolen, his father felt bad for him and bought him an 80s Martin D45 acoustic that had been a special run of guitars for Ray Henning's Hard Texas Music in Austin. Because it was a gift from his father, this guitar still has a deep sentimental meaning for Eric. His dad also found an original Vincent Bell electric sitar for Eric. His father just thought it was a really cool guitar and had no idea how rare the Bell branded electric sitars are compared to the later Dan Electro production models. And one other guitar we know that Eric had at the time his guitars were stolen was a 1966 Fender Bass 6. It seems that Eric bought another bass 6 to replace it, and used it over the years to record bass parts for demos, but he bought back the original 66 in 2006 along with the other guitars that had been stolen. He used the guitar on Bloom to record tribute to Jerry Reed. Eric's playing with Christopher Cross had led to Johnson signing a deal with Warner Brothers Reprise Records in 1984, and also led to his breakaway appearance on Austin City Limits in July of 84. This television appearance led to Johnson being named the best unknown guitarist by Guitar Player Magazine in May of 1986. The issue of the magazine included a flexi-disc of the unfinalized Cliffs of Dover fully six years before the tune would appear on a studio album. Johnson's first record with Warner Brothers was Tones in 1986. Eric appears to be holding Virginia on the cover and a black guitar that could very well be Faye is shown on the insert. And in 1988, he went back on Austin City Limits with his trio. This is likely his most famous appearance, and you can really hear how much his playing has come together working on the trio in the four intervening years. Particularly how much cleaner all the playing on Cliffs of Dover, with its long chord melody style and fully realized lead tone that makes Eric so famous, and the significant advances in the tightness of the songs from tones like Trail of Tears.
Interesting bit of trivia. When Eric learned that he was going to be on the show again, he walked into his old high school band room and simply took a marching band jacket and wore it on the show. One of those times when it's probably better to ask for forgiveness than permission. In 1990, Eric would release his seminal, Avia Musicom. Though he'd been performing it since long before the 84 Austin City Limits appearances, this is where Cliffs of Dover was recorded in the studio. I reached out to True Fire to be my sponsor because I've used them for years. With over 2 million users worldwide, whether you're a beginner, intermediate, or advanced level player, True Fire has lessons to enhance and inspire your playing. Get 35% off courses using the promo code 5Watt35. Or like I do, sign up for the All Access Pass to use the entire True Fire catalog. I really like True Fire, and I think if you give them a shot, you'll like them too. Sign up now to start your journey to being a better guitarist. I'd like to thank True Fire for their support in making this video. Eric's gone on record many times as saying that his favorite Gibson guitar is the ES-335. This seems to be driven by his youthful love of Eric Clapton's playing in Cream. Hard to argue with that. It fits this point into the timeline because of the second section of the solo on Cliffs is played on a 335, likely the same of the guitar that he used on the tune Zap from Tones. It's been cited and repeated widely, including by me, that the entire tune was recorded on a 335, but Eric said in an interview with Guitar Player Magazine in 2021 that the majority of the song was played on a 54 Strat, probably Virginia, as that was his main guitar at the time. But here he added, I played it all the way through with my Strat, but the solo didn't sound as clear and elegant as I wanted, so I punched in an ES-335 for the main section. Then it came back to the Strat for the end. You can hear the tone difference, but that's okay. The spirit is there. This early 335 was a late 50s dot neck guitar that was painted by artist Carolyn Hall for the video for Zap. She also painted the clothes for the band members to match. Eric's current 335 was bought at Groom Guitars in Nashville when he was out on tour with B.B. King, and it's the full-on Clapton. 1964 cherry red lock inlay. Eric said that it's by far the best 335 he's ever owned, as the pickups are slightly lower output. The guitar was mint, but was dinged when a photographer nicked it during the photo shoot for the gatefold for the Venus Isle record, which came out in 96. Also visible in the original gatefold for Venus Isle is a 64 Lake Placid Blue Stratocaster. I was able to verify that Eric bought at least two early 60s Lake Placid Strats in the late 80s, and I'm currently trying to track down which one this is. From the lack of wear on the body in this pick, it seems likely that he bought this guitar from Eric Ernest, who now owns Abalone Guitars and has been a vintage dealer for decades. The other Lake Placid Blue over Sunburst Strat was sold to Eric by Dave Honorado, the father of my good friend from Atlanta. There are some tracks on Venus Isle that have a different tone, and it's been speculated for years that it was the 64 that was used on those cuts. It was also Eric's memories of this guitar that drove the specs of his later Rosewood board signature model guitar, stirred together with the modern appointments like the flatter radius fingerboard that Eric likes. In 1992, Eric was at the Dallas Guitar Show and came across a great sounding 1967 Flying V. Go see my video history on the Flying V for more details, but this was the beginning of Gibson making the Vs again after the huge failure of the model in the late 50s. He wasn't looking for a V, but the guitar just sounded amazing. So in another story of horse trading, the dealer at the show said he'd trade it for a 1930s Dobro. So a friend of Eric's found the correct guitar, and they made the swap. Eric added in an interview that the frets are original, and in his words are pretty gnarly. Eric has had a number of Les Pauls over the years, including some rumored to be late 50s bursts, but I couldn't find him talking about any of these guitars, nor pictures in the interviews. We do know that in 2001, he bought a Gibson Custom Shop R9 1959 reissue. But my buddy Dave Honorato clued me in that Eric was playing an original 59 Les Paul in some of his free lessons that Eric did during the pandemic. In Dave's words, it's a fairly plain top, not unlike the famous Beano Burst guitar in terms of color. Also in 92, while out on the road with his side project Alien Love Child, Eric bought one of the two vintage strats that he still owns and uses on the road. In the classic way these stories often go, a guy brought the 57 to soundcheck to see if Eric might be interested. Eric said he wasn't looking for a vintage guitar at the time, but after playing it, he said that it totally blew away the 1960 Rosewood Strat that he was using on tour. He bought the 57 and sold the 60 upon returning to Austin. Eric swapped out the bridge pickup to his favored DiMarzio HS2, and that 57 Strat was used on every album between 2002 and 2017. The second 57 he still owns was bought at a guitar show in Florida. Both of these guitars are with him on the road in the premier guitar rig rundown that he did in 2011. 
In that rig rundown, one of the 257s has a DiMarzio in the bridge and the other has a Seymour Duncan antiquity pickup in the bridge and the middle. In the 2018 rig rundown, Eric shows a 54 Strat that he was using to play the entire Avia Musicom record in the second set of the show. Also in that rig rundown, he has a Fender Custom Shop 60s style custom Telecaster in Fiesta Red. He had them swap out the neck to maple because it's what he prefers over the rosewood that was original to the guitar. Eric had always played a lot of acoustic guitar even though it hasn't been featured much on his records. In 2003, Martin built an EJ Signature MC40 guitar. A soft cutaway OM style guitar, the very limited run was for around 90 guitars. In the early 2000s, Eric began working with Fender on a signature model Stratocaster. He took delivery of the black prototype during that process. Unlike the production guitars, it has a very flamed maple neck with dark mother of pearl dots. The bridge pickup is an HS2, DiMarzio. He had other master built prototypes in two tone burst, red, and transparent white following the release of these colors in the production runs. He's used them all on the road at various times very notably playing the white guitar for the entire run after the record he made with jazz guitarist Mike Stern. These guitars are modeled after his modified 57 Strats, with the Fender pickups mimicking the original neck and middle and the slightly hotter bridge similar to a DiMarzio. The guitar also has a trem arm that is shaped like the one from a 54, which has a slightly different bend to it. It also features staggered tuners and no string tree and a quarter saw maple necks, both very uncommon features in Fender production guitars. Many people feel that the EJ model is the best Fender production guitar you can buy. In 2007, Eric bought a 64 Gibson SG. Someone was offering to buy a couple of Eric's very old pinstripe Marshall cabinets and offered up the 64 SG in trade. Eric had had bad luck with SG staying in tune, but found this guitar stayed in tune surprisingly well, so he made the trade and he's used this on the road for his Gibson tones for years. He shows it in the 2011 rig rundown video. Eric said of the guitar, when you plug it in, it's instant wheels of fire. In 2009, Eric worked with Fender to release a second EJ Signature guitar with a bound, laminate, rosewood fingerboard. The laminated neck makes it clear that Eric was looking for the mid-60s tones, as the fingerboards were round lamb by late in 63. The binding and pearl dot markers are taken from the very rare mid-60s strats that had Jazzmaster style necks. Very, very few were made, but Eric remembered lusting after them in the Fender catalogs as a kid. The neck has a slightly softer V, and the pickups are slightly higher output than those in the Maple Neck Signature guitars. This would match the pickup output of the 60s as opposed to the 50s. There's a 3-ply, 8-hole pickguard that is also mid-60s appropriate. The bound neck seems to split folks into love it or hate it. And for the record, I love it. 2014 saw Fender releasing a thin-line EJ Signature Strat. Eric said that this was his attempt to stir together some of what he loves in a 335 with all the things he loves about a Strat. They released the guitar in vintage white, red, and two-tone burst. These are built to the same specs as the 57 spec signature guitar with the exception of the semi-hollow body with a quarter saw and maple neck. A member of 5 Watt World owns one of these guitars and said he can hear the difference and that the guitar is wonderfully light, weighing less than 7 pounds. Most recently, Eric seems to be using the 54 Masterbuilt Virginia Strats out on the road. I've yet to try one of these, but anyone that loves those first three records has to be tempted to track one down to see if you can hear the differences compared to the standard EJ Signature guitar. Of course, every guitar is different, and Eric certainly is a great example of a player that has never stopped searching for that tone. He said that in this newest Signature guitar, he has all the old tone that he remembers with all the modern playability. Certainly something worth searching for. He's had many other guitars go through his hands, and he's been pictured with them from Maiden Acoustics, he's been using on the road to old Gibson jazz boxes, and even a vintage Firebird. Eric has continued to make great records to this day, and you still hear his crystalline tones, complex chords, tasteful leads, and subtly fantastic singing on every song. For four decades, he's been an inspiration to guitarists around the world. And if you were to add up every discussion online about guitar tones, well, Eric Johnson's name is probably mentioned in a serious percentage of those. I can't think of a better way to round out a couple of months of Stratocaster players than with the guy that is the undisputed favorite of both me and the script editor here at 5 Watt World. If you missed your favorite guitar of Eric Johnson's history, add it here for in the comments for everyone to enjoy. I need to thank my good friend and longtime collaborator John Cordy for embracing his love of EJ and the piece that he wrote for the video emulating one of his heroes.
need to thank Premier Guitar for their permission to use clips from their rig rundowns with EJ over the years. I need to thank my script editor, Perry McManus. If you know where EJ's Lake Placid Blue early 60s is, let us know. It's probably the only guitar that would get Perry into a vintage Strat. And most importantly, I need to thank all of you that have gone to the store to buy a t-shirt, hoodie, or a stomp preset pack. And thank you in particular to the friends of 5 Watt on Patreon. You folks are 5 Watt world. I just make the videos. Until next time, this is Keith Williams. Thanks for hanging until the end. And most importantly, thanks for being a part of the 5 Watt world.